Hey folks, David Stewart here. Time for some more Storycraft. And today, it's a very short little no-no session, which is writing dialogue phonetically. But Stu, isn't the English alphabet phonetic? It is. What I'm talking about here is writing regional dialect or regional accents in a way that is intended to duplicate the sound of them using, say, standard English letter pronunciations. That is, you're trying to phonetically write an accent. This is something that you should do pretty sparingly. In fact, it's, I think, number seven in Elmore Leonard's 10 Rules of Writing. Use regional dialect or patois sparingly. Don't not do it at all, but you got to use it a little bit sparingly. And what I specifically want to talk about here is phonetic alterations of words to try to communicate to a reader that there's an accent. Uh, this is something that's present in comics, it's present in novels. I really uh, was pretty negative about it and I did a very short review. I'm not a full story review of this, I'll do that later, of this Helsing Deluxe Edition. But throughout this translation, turns out all the way through it, there's phonetic dialogue and it actually actively stops the reading experience. And in some cases, it's so cryptic that you actually don't know what the character is saying and you have to stop and try to do some sort of riddle guessing game to figure out what um, what the translator was intending to do with this. And it's very weird because this was originally written in Japanese, not English. So I can't really fault, uh, you know, Kota Hirano here. I have to fault Dwayne Johnson, who's translated a lot of mangas. But for whatever reason, the editorial decision here was to do this phonetic dialogue thing that, um, frankly, is not a good decision and actively disrupts the reading experience. You know, um, I, think, I think with this character here, um, that you see there's a lot of phonetic dialogue that's intended to replicate an Irish lilt on some way. And so, like, you have something that's listen to me, but it's to spell T-A-E. Listen to me. The only yins, ye, should air, and you're like, what is he saying? Listen to me. The only yins you should ever get rowdy with are demons and heathens. I'm having to translate this from a weird phonetics. Why why would he write so much phonetic dialogue? It, it stops you in your tracks and you stop reading the story and you have to start scratching your head and going, what, what is he saying here? That's when you know you've gone overboard. You can do a little bit of it. In fact, a little bit of it can clue the reader in as to what's going on. So I would say if you're going to do any phonetic alterations, keep them pretty simple and keep them limited. So you could, you know, if you have a dwarf character, you could do the standard replacing of you with ye, y-e, or maybe ye, y-e-h. Uh, and most readers are going to pick up with on the fact that that character is saying, you know, how uh, I'll, I'll get to you, right? I'll get to you instead of I'll get to you, I'll get to ye, y-e-h. They get the idea that that person speaks a little bit differently. They have a little bit of a non-standard accent, and that's really all you need to communicate. Uh, if you start putting apostrophes everywhere, then it be, it's going to become unreadable. But you don't have to actually do all these phonetic alterations in order to communicate that somebody is from a distinct location or a distinct region. Rather, you can use some of the word order that they might use, which is non-standard, or you can use some of the vocabulary that they might use, which is a little bit non-standard. So if somebody's from the rural American South, there's a whole set of words that they may or may not use and they may have a bunch of expressions that would immediately identify them as being from uh, the south you know different mannerisms that would place them there in fact if you had a story and let's say you had a character and he's scratching his head trying to figure out why his garage door won't close and his neighbor comes over and you want to communicate that that neighbor is from the rural south you'd be like you know hey bill what you doing you might write what you right there's one or what yeah, what you doing? Maybe you drop the G. So there's two little alterations there. It's still pretty readable. And they might say, I'm trying to fix my garage door opener. It's not working. You know, and, and he scratches his head and he says, well, it looks slightly cattywampus. So you have a word like cattywampus that is only the people who are using cattywampus know it. A lot of people from the city would be like, what is this word cattywampus? Or uh, it's synonyms like whopper jawed or, uh, you know, um, half a bubble off plum or something like that. People might scratch their heads, but these are expressions that would place you as being from the southern portion of the United States or um, East Texas or somewhere like that. There's a bunch of little dialogue things that cue people in. And you could put those into dialogue without doing a bunch of 
uh, alterations that would cue the listener into what's going on and give them a little bit of a flavor of the regional dialect. Likewise, if you were to look at something like Lord of the Rings, you can tell that there's a status difference and a little bit of a accent difference between, say, Sam and Frodo with pretty much no alterations to what he's doing. It's mostly word order and the context and the way the, the, the words that Sam chooses to speak to Frodo with um, that kind of indicates that he's more of a country kind of guy and, you know, Frodo's a little bit more, you know, upper class or something like that, a little bit more noble. And that's all the difference you really need to, to paint in there. I, I'd say the limit, you know, I'll, I'll use another like pretty famous example, which is like Harry Potter, right, that I just pulled off the shelf. You don't have a lot of this. Um, what you do have is a couple characters like Hagrid has dialogue that's like, told you, didn't I? It's Y-E-H. Told you, didn't I? And he didn't say, I told you, didn't I? It's told you, so you drop the I, and you put yeah instead of you. Told you you was famous. So using was instead of were, this basically tells the reader that Hagrid is like, uh, you know, pretty pretty much from a very rural country, English background, not well educated. Uh, he doesn't speak well. He, you know, he's using a lower class dialect here. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you, right? Trembling, there's a drop of a G there. Tur, meet you. There's kind of an R's, you know, they put a bit of an R sound in there. Mind you, he's usually trembling. Mind you, so he's adding in some more regional stuff there, or um, Rowling's adding in some more regional stuff to indicate Hagrid is from there. I'd probably say that that's the limit, and it's still pretty darn readable. So um, that's my cautionary tale for you guys today. So phonetic dialogue, mostly avoid it. You can have a couple words dropped in here or there to clue the reader into what's going on, but you really shouldn't go overboard and think about, oh, you know, uh, an Irish person would say this word this way. You know, they would drop this letter. So we'll do that and do that for every word. It's gonna become unreadable. And the weird thing is if you had an, an Irish person just speaking to you that way, you'd probably just understand him. So you're making the written version of what the Irish person would say like incomprehensible when an Irish person is not himself incomprehensible in any way. And you can continue that over to, to Scottish people. Imagine you put rolled R's in. So like every time somebody said like uh, something where a, a Scotsman might roll the R like, you know, then they put like a bunch of R's in the word. Like, what am I looking at? Right. You don't need to do that. You can just give a couple of, you know, a couple of hints that somebody's from, uh, from Scotland. Maybe they use a, a couple of words uh, that are, you know, from Scotland rather than having to sit, to try to phonetically write out Scottish accents. And I've seen books, I think, um, you know, there's been some more major books that have done a lot of phonetic stuff with, say, like Scottish accents. Uh, but it, I think, really harms the reader experience as novel as it might be to try to write like that. If the reader's not quickly accessing the story, they're going to get turned off, they're going to close the book, or they're going to get annoyed. So just try to use it sparingly. A couple of days, it's kind of like spice, right? A dash of pepper makes the food taste great. A whole container of pepper makes the food inedible. <laughs> so there's your cautionary tale. And, you know, with this one, they do it all the way through to where, like, even at the end, there's Germans. Germans, every single word, it's like, do you see, Freyland? If you are a commander with the slightest power of retaliation, you should know this. There is no doubt that in this world, there exists groups who are determined to settle on no goals in obtaining the, you know, it's like, that's still a bit too much. Every single W is replaced with a V. You know, every single thing is is telling you that he's got some kind of thick German accent, rather than a couple of like little hints, uh, you know, ja? <laughs> something like that that would that would indicate that that person's uh, German or Bavarian or something like that. So anyway, guys, thanks so much. I'll see you guys next time. Um, newest book. I don't even have my books around here so it's uh <laughs> it's um tyrant's gallo it's the second book in the moonsong series so you can read city of silver first and of course you can check out my book keys to prolific creativity for tips on establishing your creative process and i'll see you guys next time